we're born as human beings means we have to live in a human body and live in the human world. And both of those things bring a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. The thing about the human body, when we're born, just as our mothers were giving birth, we went through a lot of pain. And there was nobody to explain anything to us at the time. And the body has had its pains here and there ever since then. And for a while it seems to be getting better and better, stronger and stronger. But then after a while it gets sick from here and gets sick there, and it starts getting older. So there are going to be pains, for sure. Like when you're sitting here meditating right now, or you sit in one position for an hour, and the, the blood circulation gets cut off in this part of the leg and that part of the back. There's going to be some numbness, there's going to be some pain. And you can either sit here and complain about it, which doesn't accomplish anything, or you can have the attitude that no, no matter how much pain there is, no matter how much pain there is in the body, how much pain there is in the world, you want your goodness not to have to depend on everything being perfect. Because if you're going to wait for everything to be perfect, it's never going to happen. You want your goodness to be independent, like where goodness would be getting the mind in a concentration. So you don't take the pain as part of it, your way of constructing the present moment, because the present moment is something we construct. There's an input that comes in from the senses, but we also have our intentions and our skills and how to put things together. And meditation is basically learning a lot of good skills for putting the present moment together. There are basically three components to any mood that stays in the mind. What the Buddha calls fabrication, and there are three kinds. There's bodily fabrication, which is the in and out breath. Verbal fabrication, the way you talk to yourself, in technical terms it's called directed thought and evaluation, as when you direct your thoughts to a topic and then you talk to yourself about it, make comments about it. And then finally, mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. Perceptions are the labels you put on things to identify this is this and that's that. And the feelings, of course, are feeling tones of pleasure, pain, neither pleasure nor pain. And so what you want to do is find the potentials in the present moment for creating a pleasurable place for the mind to stay. So when we breathe, we try to breathe in a comfortable way. We try to breathe in a way we're thinking of the breath not just as the air coming in and out of the lungs, but as the energy flow that goes through the body. And you can ask yourself, where does the energy flow seem to be good right now? Don't focus on the area where there's a pain. Focus on the parts that you can make comfortable by the way you breathe. You can try long breathing, short breathing, fast, slow, heavy, light, or any combination of those. And see what feels best and stay in the comfortable spots. It's like eating an apple. You eat the apple and you discover there's a worm in the apple. You don't eat the wormy part, you cut that out. The rest of the apple is still good, so you focus on the part that you can eat. Here you are focusing on the part that you can get comfortable by the way you breathe. And then you can think of that good breath energy going through the pain. Say there's a pain in your knee, and there's good breath energy in the torso. Well, think of the breath energy going down the back, out the leg, and through the knee, and down out through the foot and the toes. toes. In other words, don't let it stop right at the pain, because it'll give you the sense of having a wall at the pain. That makes it worse. What you're trying to do is dissolve any shell of tension you may have built up around the pain. And at the same time, you're trying to see if a poor circulation, say, in the back or the leg is contributing to the pain. Because sometimes that happens. There's a tightness in your neck, and it actually creates a pain in your knee. So try to breathe in a way that relaxes all the muscles in the back of the neck down the spine, then out through the pain. 
When you feel confident enough, the mind is rested enough, nourished by that sense of well-being, then you can actually look directly into the pain. This is where you get into the, the other two types of fabrication, verbal fabrications. What are you telling yourself about the pain? In mental fabrication, what are the images you have in mind about the pain? You're telling yourself that the pain has a shape, that it's the same thing, say, as the knee. Well, remind yourself, pain is one thing, the body is something else, and your awareness is something else. There's three things there. It's almost like they're in one spot with a different frequency. It's like having a radio. You put your radio in one spot, you tune it to one frequency, and you get one station. You get Tijuana. Tune it to another frequency, oh, you get San Diego. You get rock, you get heavy metal, you get easy listening, whatever. It's all in the same space. You don't have to move the radio around. Simply that the different radio stations are broadcasting at different frequencies. Well, it's the same with this pain in your knee. The pain is one thing, it's one frequency. The body is a feeling of solidity and energy, warmth and coolness, and that's something else. And then your awareness of these things is something separate as well. The pain doesn't know that it's pain. The body doesn't know it's a body. So these are three things there. When you can separate them out like this, then the pain weighs a lot less on the mind. Then you can ask yourself further about that image you have of the pain in the mind. Is it, just, is it one solid mass of pain, or is it little bits and pieces of pain arising and passing away really fast? If you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's Little pain, little sensations arising and passing away, arising and passing away. And the sense of having a shape gets a lot more vague. And then as it, the little pain moments arise, think of them going away as they arise. It's like sitting in the back of an old station wagon where the seat faces back. You're riding along the road. And anything that comes into your range of vision, as soon as it comes into the range of vision, is already going away. So don't think of yourself as being the target of the pain. The pain's not aimed at you. It's going away from you. Then finally, you can ask yourself, what are you telling yourself about how long the pain has been here and how much longer it's going to be here? You tell yourself, oh, my knee has been in pain for the past ten minutes and it's going to be over oh, the rest of the hour. Okay, just that way of thinking is going to add to the suffering of the mind, make this harder and harder to endure the pain. You make it easier when you remind yourself, okay, the, the pain in the past is gone. The pain in the future hasn't come yet. There's just this moment of whatever you feel right now. And you know, sometimes the mind has a tendency to place a label on the pain that makes it stretch out longer than it is. If you see that label, just drop it. You just want to be with the pure sensation of the little pain moments arising and passing away, arising and passing away, and you find they're a lot easier to take. When you can do this, you can realize okay, that you can teach yourself to endure pains that otherwise you wouldn't have been able to endure. That means they don't get in the way of the goodness you want to create out of what you're doing and saying and thinking otherwise. In other words, you're not just enduring for the sake of enduring. You're enduring for the sake of knowledge, knowledge that you can use. If endurance on its own were a virtue, the chickens would have us all beat. They can sit on their eggs for hours and hours on end. But you have to remember, we're enduring for a purpose. Because we want to be able to create goodness in our minds, in terms of the happiness that comes from the goodness of our actions. We want that happiness to be independent of other people's goodness. If it's depending on other people being good all the time, or our body being free from pain all the time, we're not going to have much chance to be happy. We want a happiness that's independent. This is how you do it. You learn how to be wise in how you endure pains. That deals with the difficulties in the body. And then there are, of course, the difficulties in the world. We live in the human realm where there's people who say good things and say bad things. They say true things and untrue things. They mean well and they don't mean well. They say beneficial things, useless things. 
to say nothing of the things they do. And again, if you're to wait for everybody to speak to you in ways you like and do things that you like, before you can develop your own true happiness, you're never going to get there. So you have to learn how to talk to yourself again, using verbal fabrication and mental fabrication. So whatever people do or say, you can take it. You're not knocked off the path that you're trying to follow. As with other people's words. One way you can think about that is when people say something that's really nasty and unfair, instead of commenting on how nasty and unfair, unfair it is, you simply tell yourself, okay, an unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear, and it's going to stay as only as long as the contact is there. Okay, when they stop speaking, that's it. The contact is gone. The problem is we don't just leave it there at the ear. We bring it in, and then we make contact in the mind. In other words, we tell ourselves stories about how outrageous it is that that person said that and how unfair it is. Now you'd like to get back. You're the one making the contact now, and it's, it's not a pleasant contact. It's like you're stabbing yourself. And the more you get yourself worked up, the more likely you are to say or do something that you're going to regret later. You've got to tell yourself, okay, whatever they say, I can take it. It's just noise at the ear, and that's it. There's another place where they, they teach you that if remind yourself, as I said, the nature of human speech is that some people speak true things, some people speak things that are not true. Things that are well-meaning, things that are not well-meaning. Things that are useful, useless, fair, unfair. In other words, human speech has all kinds. So the fact that somebody said something unfair or nasty to you is not unusual. This is just part of the human world. This is the kind of speech you're going to run into. So you're not the only one. And because it's not outrageous that they said it, doesn't mean that you have any rights to do outrageous things in response. So you teach yourself not to stab yourself over the, what the person said. And instead the question is, what is the appropriate response? What would be the most effective thing to say or do right now? And when the mind has powers of endurance, it can think clearly to get answers to those questions. If it can endure pain, it's not going to be able to think clearly. You're going to think of something and it seems okay, and then after you say it, then you realize, nope, that's not the right thing, and you regret it. So realize that a lot of the question of whether we can endure things or not depends on how we construct our experience of the present moment out of the raw material that comes our way. And think of the skills you've got. You can breathe through things that are getting you worked up and you feel you can't stand it any longer. A lot of times just breathing through the tension allows you to realize, okay, I can't stand it. And then talk to yourself in ways that are helpful. Hold images in mind that are helpful. Learn how to create a sense of well-being simply by the way you breathe and by the way you talk to yourself. That way, what's hard to endure becomes a lot easier to endure, because you're not creating unnecessary difficulties for yourself. And as I said, this is not endurance simply for its own sake. We endure with a purpose, for the purpose of knowledge, the purpose of creating a true happiness, a happiness that we can depend on, that doesn't have to depend on things outside being good. There's a passage where the Buddha is giving meditation instructions to his son. He tells him, before you meditate, try to make your mind like earth. People throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't respond, doesn't react, doesn't get disgusted. In the same way you could say, people pour perfume on the earth, and the perfume doesn't react either. Now, this doesn't mean that when you meditate you just get non-reactive, but it means you're trying to have a certain baseline. You tell yourself, okay, whatever comes up, I can take it. And then you look at what you do as you get more proactive in the meditation, figure out how to breathe in different ways, 
how to let go of things that are weighing the mind down. And you can see objectively whether it's working or not. If your mind is very reactive, you can't see things clearly. So work on your endurance. You remind yourself it's not so much the things outside that are causing problems or even the things, pains in the body. It's your own way of constructing the present moment around them. And if you learn how to construct skillfully, then things that are hard to endure, as I said, become easy to endure. Things that are easy to endure, you hardly notice at all. When you can do that, that's when you have your own best interests in mind. You can develop a goodness, a happiness that's independent of things outside. And only when it's independent is it really secure. <laughs>